national model for accessible higher education. Uh, like a certain local university president some of us may have heard of in the Phoenix area, it escapes my uh, mind, uh, Dr. Wilson believes that a public university should advance discovery of public value, provide broad access to students from all backgrounds, and have a positive social and economic impact on the region it serves. Dr. Wilson came to UTEP after serving as Secretary of the United States Air Force from 2017 to 2019. She's the former president of the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology and Engineering and Science Research University in Rapid City. And prior to that, she represented New Mexico in the United States Congress for 10 years. Wilson also has worked on the National Security Council staff in the White House. She's worked in the private sector, serving as a senior advisor to defense and scientific industry, and as president of Keystone International, a company she founded that conducted business development and program planning work. She is the granddaughter of immigrants, and Dr. Wilson was the first person in her family to go to college. She graduated from the United States Air Force Academy in just the third graduating class to admit women. Then she earned her master's and doctoral degrees in, inter in international relations from Oxford University in England as a Rhodes Scholar while serving as an officer in the Air Force. These days in her spare time, Dr. Wilson is a member of the National Science Board, which oversees the National Science Foundation, and she chairs the Women in Aviation Advisory Board of the Federal Aviation Administration. She's been a pilot uh, since before joining the Air Force and the Air Force Academy. President Wilson and her husband, Jay Hone, have three adult children and now a granddaughter. So our format tonight is that Heather will speak for about 40 minutes, and then I'll join her on stage for a very aggressive interview. And in the third part of the evening, Secretary Wilson will take questions from the audience, so have questions in mind. And we do invite you to stay for some light refreshments that we have. So now for a discussion of lessons learned and tough choices in public leadership, please join me in welcoming to ASU the Honorable Heather Wilson. Paul, oh, thank you so much. This has been a long delayed uh, engagement. This was the first event that I had to, to cancel in 2020 as the pandemic started. It was, uh, it was supposed to be in March of 2020. So it's, it's, it's good to finally be here and be with all of you. You know, I listened to that introduction and to me the, the, most, important, the most important line was the last one. I and I got to tell you, if I could have skipped having kids and gone directly to the grandkids, <laughs> it would have been. What I'd really like to talk to you about a little bit tonight, and I'm going to step down here rather than since they've got me all mic'd up, um, is um, particularly with the students here tonight, is tough choices that, that you make as a leader. I actually think that tough choices happen to most of us every day. Um, and, and little choices add up to the habits that make good ethical decisions, I think. But I've also had a lot of different experiences in life, and I decided to just kind of do this by taking some case studies. But they happen to have been real. So, so I'd like to do this, and I'd like to do it in somewhat of an interactive way. Um, obviously, I've had a lot of different experiences in life in this constitutional republic. I've played different roles. I've supported a president of the United States on the National Security Council staff during the time when the Berlin Wall fell and the Warsaw Pact collapsed. It was an exciting period of our history. I've also served in the United States Congress in the legislative branch where my job was to represent my district. And then I've, I've also served as the Secretary of the Air Force. And so, so I, I had the opportunity to, to play a role under our Constitution and are the laws of this country as the, the service secretary. I have to tell you that if you have a choice between asking the questions or answering the questions, go for the asking side. It's, it's actually a lot easier. It's a lot easier to prepare for that, too. We can talk about that if you want to. So I'm going to talk about some cases. This young man, uh, Alo Cushing, his middle name was Aloysius, and everyone used to make fun of him, called him Alo. Grew up in El Paso, Texas. He went to the University of New Mexico. And he got an internship, and he worked with me. And then, as often happens with internships, it turned into a full-time job. 
It was his first job out of college. And there was a, a day that he came into my office and said, said uh, Congresswoman, I need to talk to you. There was an association lobbyist who, you know, the first district of New Mexico is a very difficult swing district. I probably never should have been elected in the first place. But I never had an easy race, and it was an election year. And he came in and he said, you know, one of his, one of his uh, colleagues is a lobbyist, said, hey, old buddy, I got this bill that's really important to us. And our group just spent $500,000 on TV ads to help another congressman. If your bo boss co-sponsors this bill, we'll help her too. So why do you think that bothered you? I'm going to start picking on people if you don't <laughs> volunteer. So. Why do you think that bothered him? Why did that bother him? I mean, he's not, he's probably, at the time, probably about one, two years older than you all as students. Okay, there's the line. <laughs> Why did that bother him? Yeah. Uh, perhaps it's because then policy is being determined by financial interest and not by what's right or maybe the correct policy. Could be. Could be, it might be because of it's being decided by financial interests. Anybody else have any other thoughts? Particularly among the students. The old people should have figured this out by now, I gotta tell you. All right, what do you think? Why did that bother him? Feels really transactional. Feels transactional? Anybody else? What about you? Why do you think it bothered him? I think it's not really sponsoring the, I like guess sponsoring you, it's more sponsoring this idea that you might not have been a part of. Might be sponsoring an idea I, that I might not want to have been a part of. Anybody here, anybody here, they, they probably don't, your parents probably don't do this to you anymore, but some of us who have grayer hair, anybody have your parents force you to take Latin in high school? <laughs> yeah? All right, can you translate for me quid pro quo? This for that. This for that. So this for that. So what this lobbyist was saying to Allo and indirectly to me was, if you, if you take an official action in your capacity as a member of Congress to co-sponsor this bill, then I will make sure that $500,000 goes to your campaign war chest. What's the difference between that and having your boat bought? Your boat bought. I've got to stay in the middle? Okay. <laughs> All right, so that's going to be really hard. Okay, that's going to be really hard, but I'll try. So what's, what's the difference between that and being bought? Anything? No. And actually, that action saying, if you do this, I will contribute to your congressional campaign, it's actually a crime. So one of the things that's important, no matter where you end up working, now this was in Congress, and it's particularly important there. This can happen in other things as well, right? I mean, you're an engineer, and you're working, oh, there's some other line. Um, you're an engineer, and um, you're, on, you're trying to get a bid for a road contract. So this is you know, why people go to prison for kickbacks, right? It is, well, you know, if you make sure that this contract goes to, to my firm, you know, I'll make sure that, uh, that your road gets the extra concrete or that you get something personal to benefit you in exchange for an official action. That's wrong. And Alan knew it was wrong. I'd encourage all of you to talk to the people you work with about ethics. Certainly, you know, when it comes to ethics, don't get chalk on your cleats. Stay away from the lines, right? But you need to do more than just compliance, in my view. 
You need to do the right thing for the right reason. And talk through, and a lot of ethical decisions are not always clear. You know, do you, how do you balance justice and mercy? That's a really difficult ethical question in the law. These are hard questions. And if you start to talk them through with the people that you work with, and ultimately the people who work for you, they'll have the courage and the confidence to come in and say, you know something? There's something just not right about this. I don't feel good about this. And, I don't, and he didn't know exactly why, but he knew there was something wrong with it. So creating that environment where it's OK to talk about ethics, where it's OK to have civil discourse about hard topics, is really important, whether you're in public service or whether you're in private life. So uh, we talked through what our options were um, with him at that time. And actually, that conversation and what we did after made us even closer as people. Um, because we went through some hard conversations. As it, as it happens, we ended up reporting it to the FBI. So we didn't know whether even this was a sting operation. We didn't know whether this person had tried to do it to other people. Uh, not just us. Was he already under investigation for doing so? If so, we had information that was important. And we would cooperate with the FBI. Uh, it also meant that no matter what, I could, even if I agreed, even if they had brought this to my attention and, oh my gosh, it's perfect, it's what I always promised to do, I could never co-sponsor that piece of legislation because it would give the appearance of impropriety. So that's what we chose to do. There probably were other ways to handle that, because there's often no one right answer on these things. I think the important thing was creating an environment where it's OK to talk about stuff like that. And if you feel as though you're getting chalk on your cleats, be willing to raise the issue and talk about it. So I was actually serving in Congress on 9-11. I've now come to the realization that many of you who are students here now were born post 9-11, which starts to make me feel really old. And there are a lot of things we could talk about, about you know, the reaction to 9-11, the things that happened after, ethical decisions made, a whole lot of, I mean, I, there are a lot of things I could pick to talk about. But what I want to focus on a little bit is the difference between representation and leadership. My role at the time was to represent my district under a constitutional structure that gave me a certain role that I was to play. Um, and in doing that, you're also a community leader. But your job is not to be the executive. Your job is not to be the mayor. Your job is to represent, right? So the Friday after 9-11, I was able to fly home. I was actually, um, so I was in Washington. My, my husband, by the way, was on, was on a Southwest flight uh, on the morning of 9-11 to Washington for a meeting in the Pentagon that was supposed to happen that afternoon. Hmm. They diverted to El Paso, and I was able to get through, and it, through to him and say, rent a car, drive home, nothing's, you know. So he was fine. But I was in, I was in Washington in the Congress, and then I was able, uh, there, one of the national labs had flown some equipment to New York and was deadheading, was staying overnight at Andrews Air Force Base and called our office and said, look, we're flying back empty to New Mexico. And of course, there was no other way to get, get home, and I knew there was a, a kind of a memorial service that night, Friday night, in Albuquerque that they had invited me to be at. And I was able to get home uh, on that Friday morning. And the, the, uh, it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, a big mall parking lot, thousands of people there. The sun is starting to set. It's starting to get a little bit, a little bit dusky. And I'm on the stage, a, a stage that was kind of set up specifically for this event. And, uh, um, there were a lot of speakers, local speakers, and so forth. And as they talked, they were getting more and more animated and angry. And appealing to people's desire for revenge. And I don't mean revenge in Afghanistan. 
I mean revenge on their neighbors who may not look or pray like they do. And it was a really uncomfortable situation. They were looking for somebody to blame and somebody to hold accountable. And it was getting angry. And you speak next. But you're supposed to represent these people and how they feel. You're supposed to carry their feelings forward as their member of Congress. So what do you do? I'm going to say it was one of the most uncomfortable situations I've ever been in as a public official. What do you do? It's getting dark. There are thousands of people. They're getting angry. What are you going to do? What do we do? The right thing for the right reason, but what would that mean in that circumstance? I think that's trying to get people to recognize the difference between what happened in New York City and who their neighbors were. Mm -hmm. So recognize what happened in New York City and who their and who their neighbors were. What would you do? I think I would try to appeal to uh, the sense of what it means to be an American. And I would say, you know, we're rightfully angry because we were attacked as Americans, but what is it that makes us American? It's that we don't think that way. Mm -hmm. and, and so that that desire for blame and revenge needs to be channeled appropriately. Otherwise, we become like them and we're no, worse than, no better than the people who attacked us. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. So meet them where they at, they're at, acknowledge how they're feeling, and then try to take them in a, in a slightly different direction. Anybody else want to add something? Yeah. Yeah, just talking about representation, like, um, I think it's also important in a situation like this that although you are a representative of those people, there is some room for leadership. Because, yeah. Somebody has a, we're going we're gonna to help the people who are screaming. Okay. Yeah, thank you it, for your it's help. It's not about regurgitating the views of your constituents as much as it is about mm -hmm. taking them into account and serving as a faithful representative. And so there's still, there's still room to get up on stage and, and say, like, although we're angry right now, why, why are we looking to our neighbors, our fellow Americans? And, mm -hmm. um, but, but also understanding that, I mean, people aren't just going to take, like, no, we shouldn't be angry for an answer, and there's, there's a lot of ways that you could just stir up a crowd, and so, mm -hmm. um, yeah. You touch on a really good point, which is, in some ways, this is the oldest question of representative government, right? Um, it is uh, this balance between leadership and representation. Are you elected for your judgment, for, your, for, for how you handle situations that were never anticipated when you were elected? Or you, rep or you just do what the majority of your constituents want to do? It is one of the oldest questions of representative government. Here. One more uh, addition here. Um, mourn with them, like recognize the underlying feelings of fear and sadness, you know, that's turning into anger, but what is it really? It's fear and, um, yeah, mourning. Mm -hmm. All of those things are great things, yeah, here. Um, we've touched a lot on, on the what, but you also noted that the how matters as well. Yeah. You mentioned that some of the other speakers were getting more and more animated. Um, and so I think how you deliver it, including your rhetoric, your mm -hmm. form of speech, how quickly are you speaking? Are you agitating them? Are you speaking? Mm -hmm. or, or are you approaching them? Because you're trying to turn the tide of thousands of people as just one person. Dangerous. That's a, that's a really good point, and I'll take this and then we'll go on to the other, the next question. 
or the next issue, because these, these themes, um, I didn't know what to do, and I wasn't sure what to do, but I made a decision that I would step a little bit outside my role and do something I almost never did. I knew I had to turn the tide. I knew I had to meet them where they were and not appeal necessarily up here, but right here. And I, I very, almost never did this in public, but I stepped up to the podium I said, would you please join me in prayer? And I had written a prayer on the back of the business card as I was sitting listening to this situation. And it made everyone, even those who were not themselves faithful, pause for a moment and remember those who had died Remember those who are still trying to protect us and pull us together. And, you know, and I felt tremendously vulnerable and at risk when I did so because I, 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 always, I always felt it was, as a member of Congress, I often felt that people wore their faith on their sleeves to be seen to be faithful, not because it was real. And I never wanted to be that person. But in the moment, that's how I felt. Um, fortunately, it worked because we made it home that night. <laughs> I was also in the Congress at the time we authorized the use of force against, against Iraq. This is not the first Gulf War. It is the second Gulf War after 9-11 in the fall of, 20, uh, fall of 2002. But there's a lot of this story that was not really, um, not really said at the time and couldn't have been discussed publicly. Very controversial decision. Um, but here was the situation. There were, you know, there were some people who made that decision based on you know, what the president said or what he didn't say. Or, uh, 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 there were a number of us who were trying to really deeply look at the intelligence. And, uh, there were a small number of us who had yet to decide who were brought to the White House to a meeting and shared some information which has now been made public in some of the reviews of the, the you know, thousands and thousands of pages of reviews of the intelligence after uh, the, uh, the invasion of Iraq. Um, but um, uh, not a lot of it, it didn't fit the narrative, so I don't think many people have talked about this or written about it. But um, the information was this. Saddam Hussein has a small drone program. It is affiliated and co-located with a larger drone program that we have video of using sprayers. We have assessed that there is a 50-50 chance that Saddam Hussein has weaponized smallpox. Now, all of us have just gone through a global pandemic. So we think about these things and diseases now. I have to say at the time we hadn't. That was not part of our world. But at the time I was, what, 45 years old or something like that, I don't know. And I knew I hadn't been immunized against smallpox because it had been eradicated in the United States before I needed to get a shot. So that any American under 45 or 50 hadn't been immunized against smallpox. And I don't know if it's true or not, but at the time they told us that, first of all, that I know it's true that smallpox is communicable before it's symptomatic, much like COVID. But in COVID, we're protecting all of us with masks and social distancing and everything else because the death rate is one or two percent, maybe, roughly. For smallpox, one out of three who contract it will die. At least that's what they you know. It's been a long time since we've had a smallpox pandemic. And probably healthcare is better than it was and all of those things. Very deadly disease. And there's a 50-50 chance he's weaponized. And here was the last piece of information. We have credible information that this small drone program sought to purchase 
mapping software over the United States of America. He's used chemical weapons on his own people, so he doesn't have a problem morally with doing this. And then here's the other kicker. That information was from a human, highly vulnerable source, but determined to be reliable, and he'll be killed if we reveal the information. What do you explain, first of all, that, you know, that did sway my decision somewhat on whether to authorize the use of force, even though there was not, in my view, another imminent threat. What do you tell your constituents? Your constituents are deeply divided, and they want to know, why did you vote to authorize the use of force? How do you handle this? What do you do? Any thoughts? Anyone remember? I've got to speed up a little bit here, and somebody's got to help me on the time because I don't wear a watch anymore. I left a. You do? All right. Because, because uh, when I left the Air Force, the day I left the Air Force, I stopped wearing a watch. So I, I count on others. What do you do? Anybody have a quick thought on this one? Yes, sir. Uh, Secretary, I, 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 it, it may be a little bit of what you've done before to have built up a reservoir of trust mm -hmm. with them. So, sorry, Mike. I, I said, Madam Secretary, hopefully um, what you've done before might be as important what you say now because you can only say, by definition, so much when dealing with classified information. Um, so hopefully that trust is there so when you're using some sort of guarded language or what have you, that you can be as transparent as, as, as possible, truthful as possible, whilst not you know, disclosing secrets. So, but that spade work almost has to be done years before. So, yep, it's a really so. good point. You cannot, there's no substitute for building up trust over time. But in this case, you'll notice, if you go back and look at the statements at the time, most members of Congress, some of them decided based on aluminum tubes and whether he was working on a nuclear weapons program, and that's completely true. But almost everyone, including myself, referred to weapons of mass destruction. And most of the reporters thought we were talking about the very dramatic aluminum tubes that were revealed by Colin Powell in the, in the, in the United Nations testimony and so on. And in fact, a lot of us were talking about biological weapons. And it was never discussed that way. But they are a weapon of mass destruction, and I always used that phrase, and it's absolutely true. But the real threat we were terribly, terribly frightened of was the possibility of aerosolized, aerosolized anthrax being spread by small drones over the United States of America. So checks and balances, I, we talked a little bit about this and the roles one plays, but um, it was in December of 2005 and I'm at 1st and C Street in Washington going to work to the Cannon House office building and I look at the newspaper headlines and there in the front page of the New York Times is Bush lets US spy on callers without courts. There is a Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act where if uh, if you want to collect intelligence on an American, you have to, the, the Justice Department goes to a special court and asks for permission to do so for intelligence purposes. Not because they've committed a crime, but for intelligence purposes. And it's been there after some abuses of, uh, of, um, of uh, civil rights of Americans um, in American history. And so, so there's the headline in the New York Times. You are the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, subcommittee, that oversees the National Security Agency. There is a statute with respect to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that says that the President shall ensure that the Congressional Intelligence Committees are kept fully and currently informed. That's the requirement. and you're completely blindsided. You chair the committee. This is a president of your own party. 
It's after a major terrorist attack. I actually knew the NSA director personally. Mike Hayden and I served together in shared office spaces on the National Security Council staff when, under the first President Bush when he was a colonel and had hair, and my hair wasn't great. <laughs> I don't know if the story is accurate. So what do you do? Okay, they don't get easier. <laughs> yeah, right here. I would assume that first you would want to sorry. I would assume first you would want to figure out whether or not the story is accurate, and then go from there. I don't know what you would do after that, because I haven't thought that far, but. <laughs> That's actually a good one. When I got to my office, I called the chair of the full committee, and I think what I said was roughly translated was, um, um, what the heck? <laughs> is this true? And he said, I think what he, his next remarks were, calm down, calm down, calm down, which, um, I think he sensed that I was not happy. <laughs> so you're right. First, find out what's going on here. What else? What else should you do? You're a separate, co-equal branch of government. There's a statute that says that the, in this case, it's actually the Attorney General who's supposed to keep your committee fully and currently informed. You've been completely blindsided by something that looks like a national program. What are you going to do? You look like you're thinking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel oh, like I, sorry. Hello. I'll I'll come back to you because okay. we'll bring the microphone oh. over. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say you you probably asked to be briefed and be able to talk about it in committee. Asked to be briefed. So that was a Friday. Saturday, I had a letter handle. Uh, you you want to say something or do you want to? Oh, man. All right. Okay. I'll do this. Well, but I got you. You're going to get ready because I'm coming back to you. Okay. Um, sent a letter to the Attorney General, who's the one who's supposed to keep you fully and currently informed. <clears throat> so this is December before Christmas. And um, delivered the letter. And then I hear the sound of one hand clapping um, for, uh, for about... Um, six or eight weeks. And then I actually called the White House. I followed up with the White House with a letter. And this is, you know, this is a raging storm on the front pages of the papers. And I'm, I did said nothing publicly, um, but asked them to fully and currently inform me on the facts of these, these programs. Then the Attorney General goes up to the Senate and gets absolutely savage in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee on this program. And I had taken the uh, opportunity to, um, to uh, if you can't get the classified information, go back to the unclassified source documents. So I started reading the statute, trying to figure out what they were doing. And then I also did something. If, since I wasn't briefed on the classified stuff, there was, I couldn't talk about classified information because they hadn't briefed me. So I called the two reporters for the New York Times and asked them to come meet with me <laughs> and said, what do you think you know? <laughs> which was very useful. And the day after that disastrous testimony by the Attorney General, I called those New York Times reporters back. And I said, I want to let you know that I'm holding a press conference tomorrow and that, uh, that we are going to hold hearings and do oversight on the President's terrorist surveillance program. And they, they, they said, uh, do you mind if we call the White House to get their response? And I said, I think that would be entirely appropriate. Because I wanted them to not only have their response, but to be reading the clips in the morning and to know that they had a problem. Because I was a subcommittee chair. And they could not stop me from holding hearings. The result was that at 11 AM on that following day, they started briefing the Congress and our committee. I had a role to play. And sometimes in this self-governing republic, 
You just have to do your role. You don't have to solve everything for everybody, but you've got to live up to your responsibility. The president had a responsibility too, and I fully respect that as commander in chief. But in the area where intelligence meets civil liberties, we have to be able to have the checks and balances work. And sometimes that works in classified session, but you can't just look the other way. You have to do the work. And in this case, if they wouldn't do it politely and quietly, I was going to have to go public with it. And I got to tell you, the President of the United States didn't like that much. Uh, he was not, um, and I'm, I'm in a, an enda you know, I'm, I serve in a very difficult district. Um, I'm a member of his own party, and I was saying publicly, this isn't good enough. It was a really uncomfortable situation to be in. Um, and I had some people, I, you know, it's amazing how people sometimes um, misjudge. But um, I, it's not on this case, but in another circumstance, somebody who was one of the, in, in part of the leadership, uh, tried to make clear to me that, you know, my committee positions in the next Congress might not be quite so, so sure if I kept making trouble on an issue. And I said, I said to him, and I won't say his name, but I, I, I'll just use yours, um, Roy. Um, you know, you need to talk to my husband. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can reason with me, you can educate me. If you can make me laugh, you can get just about anything. But if you try to twist my arm, I am just really stubborn. <laughs> It's the last time he ever tried to do something contrary to my sense of what I needed to do for my constituents. He did learn to make me laugh. He did try to educate me. And there were times where I didn't even do something for fellowship's sake if it wasn't, you know, wasn't important for my district or something like that. But I can't be bought and I can't be bullied. And in this case, um, some people were thinking that I would just sit there and let it pass, and I wouldn't. Sometimes you just can't let it pass, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it creates problems in your other relationships, you just have a job to do, and just do the job. Two and a half years later, I was there at the signing ceremony for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act amendments in 2008. Two and a half years of work, changes in control in the Congress, all kinds of other issues and incidents, but we managed to improve the law as a result, and it required a lot of work between the Intelligence Committee and the Oversight Committees in the Congress. And one of the things I was most proud of, my kids were there. We used to do uh, Boys Week and Girls Week in Washington, and sometimes they both came together if my husband was on reserve duty or something, and they were there that week where we had the debate, and they missed, they will tell you to this day, they missed a game of the Washington Nationals because the debate went too long on the floor. <laughs> But it got done. And when we were flying back from Washington, I, I was, we were with, the, with both kids, so my kids were like this at the time. And um, we through Chicago, and when we got to Chicago, I turned on my cell phone and there was a voice message, and I listened to it. And then I passed it to my kids. It was the President of the United States saying thank you for your leadership and getting this fixed. He did not say that two and a half years before. <laughs> so this is one more, and I'll, uh, I'll leave it at this. Um, I was the Secretary of the Air Force, and it was a Sunday morning, and someone walked into a church, the worst mass murder in Texas history. And then the Inspector General called me on that Sunday before lunch and said, I think we may have a problem. This guy may have been an airman. He called back a few hours later and said, yeah, he was an airman, but it gets even worse. He committed an offense and was discharged for it that should have been reported to the FBI under a statute that was uh, put in place in 2007. He should have been prevented from purchasing a weapon if there was a background check. We think the Air Force failed to report it. And as a result, he was able to buy a weapon. So what do you do? Only five minutes, so you're on the, you know, your IG has just called you. What do you do? 
So I think your previous story lends itself to this one. Um, is that me? I, I think it lends itself to this one because I, I think immediately it calls for oversight. Because um, yeah. there's clearly some issue that led to that not being reported, mm -hmm. whether that be someone protecting yep. someone else or, or just laziness or just getting caught up in the weeds and, and, yep. and it got lost somewhere. And Stuff so, happens. Yeah. Yep. And, and similarly, I think like it calls for reform and it calls for leadership in this spot where you have to say, like, look, we, we messed up. And it, in, uh, well, it may not have directly led to this, it, as a consequence, this, this was able to happen. Yep. Um, and, and being able to, to both acknowledge what you did wrong, or what, what the organization did wrong, and, and also um, put forth steps to, like, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to prevent this from happening again? I think that's most important. So I'm going to hire this kid as an intern someday. <laughs> he, uh, he's pretty good. Um, by the way, one of the things in that case was we, we did get together the following morning to get the facts. Uh, the chief of staff and I and uh, a, a lot of the senior staff of the services, including the inspector general and the lawyers. And uh, in that case, the lawyer at that meeting said, um, I, when we said, all right, this, is, this happened, we think we should come clean about this and start focus on fi fixing it. Don't just say, well, we're looking into it. Uh, we're doing an investigation or what uh, we need to say what we know and then focus on fixing the problem and the only person in the room that disagreed with that approach was the lawyer who said well you know you can couch this with uh, you know we're continuing to uh, review and uh, find facts and so on uh, because he was worried about liability not responsibility and that was a good perspective and we needed to hear that at that table. But lawyers give advice. They don't make decisions. And you've got to be able to absorb that device and make the call. We decided that we would fess up, that we had screwed this up. And we pulled together a task force of 60 people to go back through every single discharge record in the United States Air Force until 2007 to make sure that we hadn't done it, made another mistake. And then we fixed the systems between the FBI and the services so it wasn't god-awful hard to get it done. People didn't do it intentionally. They did it because they got 20 million things to do, and this is another form, and you got to figure out where to file it, and it's just a mess. So can we make it easy to do the right thing? And we did that for all the services. But we did it contrary to the advice of our lawyers, which is all not an exactly a comfortable place to be in all the time. Finally, a few reflections. Think about and talk about ethics with your team. No matter where you are, what your job is, little choices make big decisions easier. Getting in the habit of not telling little white lies. Because when the big decisions come, you will have the habit of building up all those little decisions. Stuff happens, mistakes happen. Don't deny it, go ahead and own it. And finally, I would say that each of us has an obligation to serve in some way in different parts of our lives. And it may be on the planning commission or on the school board or in some other way, but we all serve in a self-governing republic. You have a responsibility not just to vote, but to participate in self-governance. And the final thing I would say is this. The most important people in your world will be watching whether it's your parents or your grandparents, or in my case, a couple of kids who used to be able to wear the Air Force gear to the UNM game. We have a family rule. We have a lot of family rules. <laughs> but one of them is don't shame the family. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much for your remarks and for the discussion. And uh, first, I just want to say thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, Secretary Wilson made an, a, a set of remarks earlier today to one of our courses on civil military relations in the school. And we had cadets and midshipmen from the RTC programs here on campus who were there. So that was a terrific 
experience, so thank you for that. Um, so since there were Navy people there, I talked very slowly. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> um, you, not surprising to me, you talked about character or ethics in relation to leadership and service. So I wanted to begin, uh, because you also are an educational leader, by asking your advice uh, more broadly to Americans, to those of us who are younger and trying to develop ideas of character and leadership, what, what sources might be most important? Is it, is it ideas and studying? Is it finding a mentor and getting experience? Um, is it reading biographies rather than just general uh, <laughs> theories? What, or is it all of those things? What, what advice do you have about it? For, uh, particularly for the young people here, but really for everyone, reading widely and voraciously um, to learn from other people's mistakes. <laughs> because oftentimes people will write about them, both themselves and also um, others who are writing about history or even about leadership. I think the other thing is there is no substitute for experience. The lessons that you learn that result in bruises are pretty well learned. Um, so and the final thing I would say, so, so, so experiences and giving yourselves the experience of learning to lead, reading widely, and then I would, I, uh, I guess my final thought, and maybe I'll use an analogy to explain it. So my dad was a mechanic and a pilot, and we lived on the end of this road in New Hampshire, and uh, this was back when there used to be traveling salesmen. So people, this was like way pre-Amazon, okay? So people would actually come out and sell things door to door. And there was the Snap-on Tools guy. He had a red truck that looked like a Snap-on Tools box, but he'd come, he'd drive, he'd pull in the yard. My dad would come out of the garage. It was like Christmas. And he'd sit there and he'd talk to the Snap-on Tools guy for a while, and they'd laugh and things. And at the end, my dad would you know, pull out his wallet, and give the guy some money, and he'd open the back of his truck, and he'd give my dad a tool. And my dad would go chuckling back into the garage, and he put the tool in the toolbox. My dad didn't really need the tool that, way, that day. But he had the tool in his box. And he also had a relationship with a Snap-on Tools guy, so if he needed to make a special trip, he could probably get what he needed. Collect tools, experiences, education, um, credentials that'll lead you to be able to have stuff in your box even if you don't really need it today. Because there's going to come a day as a leader you're going to be going, man, I've got to find something in my box because I have no clue what to do right now. Fortunately, everybody around the table probably, if they're good, will have collected different tools than you have. And then you swarm, you know, then it's like Apollo 13 in that great scene where you go, all right, how are we going to make a carbon uh, monoxide detector out of this stuff? And you'll figure it out. But you can't do that if you haven't collected tools, even if you don't need them today. N another theme you talked about is our republic. We are Americans with a constitutional yeah. republic. So I wanted to ask about... Um, how unusual that is today, to be honest. We talk a lot about how polarized we are, um, this angry, negative polarization um, in which you're most suspicious of people from the other party or for some other group just because they are from that other mm -hmm. uh, party group. So is it, is it plausible today to have leaders who talk about, on the one hand, it openly being from one, you mentioned, you were in one political party, the Republican Party, but can leaders also talk about shared American <laughs> principles uh, and, and be seen as plausible and legitimate? Is that, is that a way of trying to repair, or as we have as the theme of our, our series this year, renewing a, a civic compact mm -hmm. that we have with each other? Or is that just not, is that just pie in the sky and unreal. No, I think it happens a lot. Now, I would, would say you're right, that we are more polarized than we have been um, probably 
not at any time in our history. The Civil War was kind of a polarizing event, um, but certainly in recent history. And, but um, I, at the same time, you know, if traffic is going by normally on East University, we're not standing at the windows looking at it. But if there's a wreck there, we all watch it. And the news media and social media and things all magnify that. Um, yet there is a lot going on in our lives and with our colleagues that doesn't necessarily attract attention and work gets done. And I think it is possible to do those things, to find the common ground on whether it's on education or water policy or, um, or, or you know, pick, pick a subject, science, um, defense. Uh, there's a lot of things where there is common ground, even on very polarizing issues. And you may not accomplish something in a very short term, and it frustrates people. I, I have to say that one of the hardest things about being in Congress was how long it takes to get anything done. And, and I'd have to get philosophical about that, that our structure of government was not set up to be efficient. It was set up to protect us from tyranny. So it is hard to change things. And maybe that's OK. But yeah, it is possible to find common ground in our communities, in our houses of worship, around the dinner table at Thanksgiving. Yeah, I think it is. The, the early scenario that you talked about of an effective quid pro quo, I mean, the background principle there was that the public trust was a, a, a common American good, a common good, that you were meant to serve rather than exploit. Your yeah. office was representing that. And, and so uh, this goes back to my f first question. We, we would need to, it sounds very old fashioned, implausible. I mean, you know. You're becoming we, a can cynic, we, Paul. Can we teach about those things <laughs> and have it say, in a, in a very practical way, our form of politics won't function Mm -hmm. If you want to be practical, be practical. Our former politics won't function unless we spend some time teaching ourselves as citizens, young and middle and old, that common shared principles do exist, they do matter, mm -hmm. they shape everyday political debate and political discussions. I agree completely. And, uh, and I think it's entirely possible to find people in public service who are, and, and it's, it's not just in Congress, it's on the school board. It's in the city council. It's at the county commission. Um, uh, it's on the board of regents, where there there is a set of there is a feeling of common purpose, and a willingness to listen to each other, in order to accomplish things that none of us can do alone, and to build a sense of of a, of a, of a working majority. I think it's entirely possible. Your, your reference just now to tyranny and liberty, um, I mentioned this to you earlier today. Um, the, the national poll that was conducted a few weeks ago in the wake of the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, which brought up an attitude about liberty in, in the United States. So a very reputable polling firm, Quinnipiac, posed a series of questions about that international situation, but then asked Americans for their attitudes about America in one particular question. And it was asked if America were invaded, as Ukraine has just been invaded, would you fight the way the Ukrainians seem to be fighting, or would you flee, in effect? Mm -hmm. And for the younger generation in the poll, 18 to 34, a majority said they would not fight. A near majority said no, wouldn't fight, and then another small percentage was undecided. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was only the minority, 44%, that said we'd stay and fight. So, what, 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 is, what does that say about the situation we're in regarding that fundamental American principle that our politics is about liberty? Mm -hmm. Liberty means free speech, complicated form of government, <laughs> all the, the, this, these very civic uh, virtues. Yeah. What's, what's your response to that and what, what we might do? Given? Well, first of all, we're, we're, we're very privileged that uh, you know, during World War II, one in 10 Americans served in uniform, one in 10. 
So it meant like every third house on the block had a blue star in the window. Today it's two in a thousand. So we, and we're protected, right? There's uh, probably some of you in this room have family members who are first responders, who are police officers. We're, we're blessed to live in a very safe environment for the most part. I mean, the crime still happens and so forth, but, but it's, uh, we're, we live a very protected life. But I'll say to you, when I arrived at Oxford, um, there was the Oxford Union where they had debates. And one night, I, I was a member of the union. I never debated there. I went to listen a lot, though. And uh, one night, there were all these television cameras and things. And I went to the debate. And the debate was a repeat of a debate that happened um, just before the Second World War. And the resolution was this. This house will not fight for king or country. And it happened when Hitler had risen to power in Germany. And there are some historians who believe that that vote where the, the Oxford Union voted and said in the 1930s that they would not fight for king and country, that, it, that emboldened Hitler to believe that Britain would not fight if he became an aggressor in Europe. And several of the people then, gray-haired, came back in 1982 to debate that same resolution again and regretted that they had debated it and were on the wrong side. And to a person, each one of them had served in the British military during World War II. Sometimes the things you think you would not do when confronted with the reality, you would do. I started my life as a young officer in the military, and you know, you go through all these things that you, you know, what's worth fighting for, what's worth dying for, what's worth killing for. Mm -hmm. uh, those were all discussions up here until my children were born. And then I knew if anyone, anyone, tried to touch them, they'd have to kill me first. Um, so, so that reality, when reality confronts you, that you are facing evil, as Ukraine is doing right now, sometimes you have no choice but to fight to defend your family and your freedom. And the Ukrainians know but it was, there are several books that, uh, that are worth reading on the Ukraine, and Applebaum's books, about the crushing of Eastern Europe from 1945 to 1954, and the famine, Stalin's famine. And she wrote a book on that as well, called, I think it's called Red Famine. Great books on the history of Eastern Europe. The Ukrainians know what it was like to live under Russia and Stalin and the Soviet Union. There's a reason that they're fighting as hard as they are today. So, so sometimes, and the final thing is, is that those, you know, while it's just a poll, um, when, we can, when we're safe and protected and we can say, well, I wouldn't fight. Maybe in this country other people would do it for you. But I tell you, those who, who say they would not fight if faced with their family dying, they'd fight. Um, I think that, um, so, so, uh, the result of the, uh, the second time that they had that debate, um, this house will not fight for queen or country. <laughs> because Queen Elizabeth, of course, was the, the queen then in 1982. Um, the result was different. And they resolved that they would. Because they knew they would, because they lived through it, and they had. Thank you. Well. I don't want to monopolize the questions, so we do have a microphone that we'll bring into the center aisle. Um, this is a custom for our speaker events to allow Q&A. So my favorite food is green chili, and my favorite color is <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we ask that you pose brief questions rather than uh, statements.
It's a docile group. Oh, there's Angel. There we go. One of our students. Figured somebody had to jump up here first. Um, uh, a concept and idea I've been really interested in uh, concerning leadership is decisiveness. Um, and as a young person seeking to improve my own leadership and judgment, how, how can I do that? How can I go about being a better decision maker and hone in my judgment uh, in these situations? So maybe if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Usually hone, honing judgment comes from having bad judgment about previous uh -huh. situations. I mean, there's no substitute for experience. Um, and also, I, I would think reading widely about how people have handled difficult situations. And sometimes it's reading different things from different perspectives on the same problem and understanding how different people have approached a similar, a, a similar set of events. Um, uh, and it's easier to do that in, with history than it is with current politics, I think, because so much of current politics is about advocating for a particular point of view and convincing people that free enterprise is better than you know, some alternative. And, it, and you, it's hard to get away from that. But once you have the distance of history, many of the issues are the same, but you, you learn from other, other people's mistakes. But I think there's, there's probably no substitute for getting out there and making, taking responsibility and leading. Is that true about that when you were in Britain studying international relations, is that, that the British view at the time in academia was that the study of history was as important as an attempts at coming up with theories or doctrines mm -hmm. about how states or the international yeah. system. So it was more of a blend. The Amer Americans, political science departments or schools of international relations and and unfortunately, more theoretical, right? Yeah. And un unfortunately, I, I don't like the way we teach political science or it, it, in the United States, I have to say. I, and I, uh, it is, you know, we, we uh, study things that don't matter because we have data for them as opposed to a more historical and holistic approach for, for why, why people do what they do. So I have a debate about that with my own faculty. But. <laughs> Hi, my name is Flannery. I'm a student in Skettle. Um, my question is, with my generation, a lot of kids have a negative view when it comes to police, military, and things like that. How can we change that mindset? How can we turn it back to being something positive and looking at these people as heroes like we used to? Yeah, I think the military is, I may be wrong on this, I haven't seen numbers recently, but I think the military is still one of the most highly regarded um, institutions in, in, the, in the country. Um, so so the, the, uh, I think that respect is still there. You're right about the police and what the country has probably gone through in the last couple of years. Um, I think uh, Engaging, and, and it's actually a really good example of where civic engagement and discourse is probably useful. As a, you can understand if you're a law enforcement officer or the family of a law enforcement officer, and they go to work every day and you kind of wonder whether they're going to come home, you're going to cut them a lot of slack. And they often see the seedy side of society that most of us don't even want to believe exists sometimes. Um, and and you can understand how if you're working in that world all the time, you don't get to see the kind of wonderful things we get to see in our lives um, all day, every day, in the development of young people. So that's probably a good example of where, not, not I don't mean on a big national scale, I mean on a local engaged way of a round table of, of people who are in law enforcement with students who have concerns. And that kind of a dialogue can do wonders on a campus. So Thank start you. from where you are. Thank you. I could ask you about the size of the police force at UTEP, right? I mean, how many? 33. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thanks for sticking it out, Paul, and making sure this, uh, this came to be. Um, I couldn't help but see a through line that you could probably speak to with regards to representation and uh, connection to the public, um, 2003 versus 2017. Um, they're like like 80 years apart with regards to information sharing, yeah. um, and the way people see the world, or the way people um, get information. So I wonder if you could speak to that of, yeah. you know, 
approaching, maybe take that same idea. Um, 2003, that church shooting happened. There's probably three forms of information that the public is gonna get in three different lanes. But in 2017, there's 35 different lanes. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering if you could speak to maybe future leaders as to yeah. what kind of things do you need to do to thwart that, uh, like stand in a place of authority and leadership, but be able to say what's right, because we're not really sure. I actually think this is a fascinating subject, and it's also one of the ways in which we, we tend to migrate to things that we agree with. And it's one of the reasons why there is polarization, because we listen to people who are reaffirming what we already believe. It also, there's, there's other aspects of this that create time compression, right? The feeling that, okay, something happened uh, and it's on Twitter today, you've got to, you know, you're the member of Congress, we need to ask you what you think about this, when that never would have even come up before because it didn't make it on Walter Cronkite at the five o'clock news. Um, so it wasn't, um, so, so I think there's something to this about segmentation. And one of the things I hate about social media is I click that I want to follow people because I want to follow people. I don't want the company to tell me, well, I haven't pressed like or share enough for that person in order for them to show up on my feed. But they are, and I, and I, they are trying to feed me things that I will like rather than let me decide what I want to like. And I, so I, I'm concerned about that effect on our society to, to, because it tends to force uh, segmentation and disconnection from other people's points of view. And so I am very concerned about that. One little squib, if I may. So when I was elected to Congress in 1998, I inherited the database from my predecessor who got it from his predecessor. So it went back to the 1960s, which was fascinating. In the 1960s, somebody would sit down at their kitchen table and write a letter to my predecessor saying, you know, please protect my social security. With my predecessor, C-SPAN started, and they'd say, why did you vote against House Bill such and such on Social Security? When I became a member of Congress, they would email me and say, why did you vote against the motion to recommit the amendments on the Social Security <laughs> Reform Act, such and such and such and such? And if I didn't answer them by the next day, they were angry at my lack of responsiveness. So it went from three weeks on a generalized topic to instantaneous on a very narrow issue in about 30 years period of time because of the availability of information. Now, so it's hard to, I don't know how we deal with all of that, but I watched it, um, watched it happen. Yeah. As well, um, I guess my question or something that I personally struggle with is I have trouble associating or putting my name on a program or a party uh, or something that has values that I don't necessarily 100% stand with uh, or that I don't 100% agree with. I guess my question is, how do you determine if you are working through a flawed system to make necessary change versus morally or ethically compromising yourself mm -hmm. in ways that you don't necessarily need to? So political parties tend to be collections of people who don't all think the same thing about, and the issues change over time. You know, the Republican Party was, was free men and free land. It was about westward expansion and slavery, right? So that's not the set of issues that brings people together today. There are different sets of issues, and coalitions change over time. Um, but the, the general gist with political parties, which, by the way, are not, a, you know, they're not in our Constitution, and, and Washington warned against them, but, but um, is if I agree with someone roughly 80% of the time, um, that's probably the general coalition that you might be a part of politically. But uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't disagreements within that coalition. The, one of the things I think is not necessarily great for American politics these days is that it's very hard for a third party to ever get started or for parties themselves to, to morph into something different. 
That historically wasn't true, but it's almost impossible to get on the ballot if you're a third party candidate. Um, and I'm not sure that's healthy for us as a country. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, I think it was really touching to hear that story um, of after 9 11, how, you know, in trying to calm down this crowd, you ultimately decided to, to appeal to the hearts of those people rather than appeal to the to their minds. And I, I think one of the things I've noticed being on the university is a lot of Americans, but especially young Americans, tend to make decisions um, based on emotions or passions that we may feel on certain topics. Um, so I'm curious how, based on your experience, how you sort of differentiate between when it is appropriate to lead with the heart versus when it may be appropriate to lead with our more rational and thought out self. Um. That's actually a good question. I tend to probably, um, particularly in communications, try to appeal to people's hearts. But I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a, just a I'm a complete geek when it comes to analysis and numbers. And so so I actually have to force myself sometimes to realize that that doesn't persuade anybody. That doesn't really explain in a way that people can relate to. And stories do. And so so that was probably a learned behavior. Um, to be able to, to explain things to people in ways that matter to them or that, that make sense to them. Um, I don't think it's an either or. Uh, and, um, and I think good public servants probably can do both. Um, but, uh, I, you know, Republicans are often accused of being too analytical and not having enough heart. Um, and I, I don't think that's true. But I, I also think that sometimes we're not very good at communicating it. Um, and um, so, um, and it, you know, that, that night, one of the things that was hard, my children were there that night. And, uh, and I was, uh, after 9-11, um, that was the first time I saw that my husband brought them and we met there at the mall. And uh, it was interesting, we had kept the televisions off because I was in Washington. We didn't want them to see any of this. It was just, it was too hard. Um, and um, my son was in second grade, I guess. My daughter was in kindergarten. And, um, and uh, um, my children, particularly my daughter, who is more emotionally intelligent than my son will ever be, um, I, she was fine until she saw how other people interacted with me and she, that people were just breaking down crying. And it was uh, people, it was a very emotional time. Um, and for me, what I needed was a way to let people breathe for a minute and recenter. Um, and that's the way I chose to do it. And I don't know if it was right or not. I really don't. Um, I really don't. Thank you. So we have time for just these last two questions. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Colton, I'm a senior in Skettle. I think it's fair to say that you've served our country in extraordinary ways. And given your experience, I'm curious, um, what are some ways for individuals in younger generations like myself to serve our country that does, it is not as grand as serving in Congress or as an officer in the military, uh, but is nonetheless as important? Just look around you at what needs to be done. There's so much that needs to be done. I remember moving to New Mexico and there was a local elementary school that needed judges for the science fair. I'm there. <laughs> you know, I can do elementary science fair. I probably can't do the high school kids anymore, but I can do that. Um, just serve. Or as my husband would say, shut up and start bailing, you know? I, and it, it could be the scout troop. It could be the, the committee raising money to fix the church roof. Civil society is much stronger than government. That's one, of the, that's one of the most important things about this country, is that it's the civil society that determines the culture is upstream of politics and government. And so choosing to get involved where you are with what you've got on what you care about makes a huge difference. And, and there are so many gaps. There's so many kids that need mentors. There's so many planning commissions that need civil engineers. Uh, there, there's, there's a civic responsibility 
And that's what makes this country strong. It's not the government, it's not the White House, it's your house that matters most. And I think there are plenty of opportunities to do meaningful work. And you will find it tremendously satisfying. You really will. Um, so don't wait until 20 years from now to say, okay, I've raised my family, I've had my, my career, and now I'm gonna serve my community. That starts today. Thank you. Thank you again for your talk. Um, I, with, with the career path like yours, where you started in civic service and, and now you're university president, um, and, and you've touched on how important education is, I just, I just wonder what you've learned as, as a leader in education, both, both about the importance of education and how, how we best catapult the next generation into, um, into leadership, but also um, how to galvanize people behind behind education? Like how how do you? Mm -hmm. Sorry, how do you work as a leader um, in yeah. education? How do you have the greatest impact? So this university and UTEP share something in common, and that is that we do not judge ourselves by whom we exclude, but by whom we include in their success. I think American higher education as a whole kind of was done a terrible disservice by U.S. News and World Report about 30 years ago, starting to say that if you refuse to serve somebody, you must be great. Um, you know, we don't do that for restaurants on Yelp, <laughs> but we'll say that about universities. Um, that makes no sense. And more public universities are saying more, and it, the, the you know, you look at all the jobs created in America since 2008, 90% of them require some meaningful post high school credential. Notice I didn't say a college degree, and I, and I, I, you know, I run a university, but I think a meaningful post-high school credential is what most students need. And it may be a college degree, it may be an associate's degree, it may be learning to be an electrician or a plumber or whatever makes you happy and, and fulfills you. But more of our children need that. And what was good enough for our grandparents and our parents is not good enough for our children and our grandchildren. The biggest, I, one of the reasons I'm in higher education is that I believe that the next 20 years and the continued prosperity and security of this country will be determined by our ability to educate more Americans and not leave Americans behind. That's one of the reasons I'm at UTEP, is because it has shown itself, it is the only top tier research university in the country, and an R1 university, top 5% with respect to research, with, you know, uh, and we're the only one of 141 or whatever there are that is still an open access institution. If you've graduated from high school, we will give you a shot. And if you're willing, we are not a sink or swim kind of place. We're a come with us, it's going to be fun, and we're going to teach you to swim kind of place. And more of higher education needs to be like that because we need to engage those who are not engaged in continuing education. The final thing I will say is unlike our generation where we went to school for four years, we went out, and maybe we, you know, maybe we come back and do grad school for two years, it's gonna be more of a spiral of continuous education in a variety of ways throughout your life. And the reason is because the pace of change is accelerating. In 1982, when I graduated from college, IBM invented the first desktop computer. It had a four inch floppy disk, and you know something? You could get an entire 300 page thesis if you had about 10 of those disks. It was amazing. <laughs> and it, was, it was really cool. Or in my case, my grandfather had a, uh, didn't have a high school degree. He was one of the first flyers, first pilots in the Royal Air Force. My father had a high school degree, but he didn't go to college. He was a commercial pilot. You cannot do the same things in the same way. You, and you think about that, and, you know, um, um, in 1969, my, my grandfather started flying shortly after the Wright brothers, and he lived to see a man walk on the moon. And the computer that took Neil Armstrong to the moon had less power than the phone in your pocket. Pace of change is accelerating, which means your life will be de defined by learning. And institutions like this, and the one I lead, have to adapt to that and enable continuous learning 
in order for America to succeed. Thank you. And I still Thank want you. you as an intern. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have, a, I have just a, I have a few closing um, remarks. Um, first to all the students out there or people who care about students. There's a whole array of uh, printed information about the school, our, our degrees and uh, new PPE, philosophy, politics, economics uh, certificate. I wanted to mention that our final event this year in the Civic Discourse Project is just about two weeks from now on April 13th, John Tomasi, formerly a professor at Brown University, is now the first president of a higher education reform group called Heterodox Academy. And John's going to be here to talk about what the goal of a university is. Is it to pursue knowledge or is it to pursue social justice? So that's April 13th. <clears throat> on this theme of heterodoxy and robust discourse, I think there are cards on your uh, chairs put down by our staff. If you appreciate this kind of event, if you appreciate our school, we hope you might think about um, donating and supporting it, enrichment experiences we offer for students, scholarships, and also this kind of a public uh, speaker program. Um, we hope, uh, um, oh, I, I need to say thank you to our uh, team that puts on these events. First, uh, Dr. Carol McNamara, our Associate Director of the School for Public Programs. Um, the other members of the team, um, our uh, event staff, Morgan and her team, Marcia, our communications director, our student workers, um, we're grateful for the efforts that they put on. Um, I hope you will uh, look for our podcast, which is called Keeping It Civil. Uh, it's on iTunes, it's on Podbean, other places um, where you find podcasts. Uh, we do have some refreshments here for reception if you want to continue the conversation. That's one of the advantages coming to a public event. And with that, thank you for being here. And please join me in one last thanks to Secretary Heather Wilson. Thank you.